Good morning. I want to welcome you to Round Prairie's online service for today. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope that you'll receive a blessing from being online with us today. Hopefully soon we'll be able to uh, rejoin together in, in one body, uh, in one place, uh, in our worship service. And speaking of that, our, our building progress is, is very far along. Uh, we should be through here maybe in two, three, four weeks, something like that. So by the time this is all over, we expect that we'll be able to go straight into one service in our new uh, expanded sanctuary. And we're so excited about that. Here in just a moment, Pastor Chris is going to be here to uh, preach his second uh, sermon in the series called Faith Works from the Book of James. Today he's going to be talking on the subject of temptation. Now temptation is something that we all face every day and many times a day. Today he's going to be talking about the process of temptation and how to overcome it. So I pray that you'll uh, have your notes out and be ready to take them and uh, learn what you need to learn and let God speak to your heart and uh, as he teaches you and me how to overcome the temptation that we face on a daily basis. Again, thank you for joining us. Welcome, and may God bless you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me yeah. Lord I Temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. I count on one 
be the same God who never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. I choose to pray to glorify by the name of all names that nothing can stand against yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy oh Hey, good morning, everybody. I want to say welcome uh, to Round Prairie Baptist Church, and uh, thank you so much for choosing to come online and to worship with us today. I'm so excited about today. Uh, today we're continuing a series called Faith Works, and we're traveling through the book of James as we talk about how saving faith truly impacts the way in which we live our lives. You know, last week we talked about something incredibly uh, pertinent to everybody's life, and that is how to face adversity in life as a Christian. One of the things we saw last week that I thought was really just resonated with a lot of people, resonated with myself, was when uh, James actually called people to count it joy when you face trials. And the reason that we can face trials as believers, um, even though that's counterintuitive and that's so out of character with what we usually think about when we think of trials, we can count it joy because as believers, we understand that God is doing a work in the midst of those trials to bring us to maturity. Well, today, James is going to move on to another topic, kind of connected, but the topic is on the topic of temptation. The, he's going to discuss what temptation is. In other words, how do we become tempted. You know, when you hear the word temptation, a lot of us probably have a lot of different ideas about what temptation looks like. And what I've found in my life is that temptations have kind of changed as the years have gone by. Things that I used to be tempted with, I'm not as tempted with anymore. And some things that I used to not be tempted with, I find myself tempted with um, now at almost 40 years old. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but um, I'm the only staff member left at Round Prairie not in the 40-year-old category. So I'm just going to lay that out there for Chris O and Craig and, and, all, and, and, and Jeff. But, um, but, but even being almost 40, I've noticed that temptation has taken some different forms over my life. But one of the things that is true is that there are certain things that I, I think I've always battled and I think I always will. You know, and I bet right now if I were to really give a poll out there, and we're not going to do it, don't worry. You don't have to like put an emoji with your temptation, your greatest struggle. But I bet if we ask everybody right now, hey, do you have one thing in your life that really just continues to kind of gnaw at you? Do you have one thing in your life that continues to kind of just be that thing that you struggle with, that thing that you feel like keeps you um, from really moving forward in your faith? Well, if that's the case, I think a talk about temptation is going to be so critical for you today. I think when we talk about temptation, we need to really understand that temptation is a much bigger deal than what most people really believe um, that it is. You know, when a lot of people think of temptation, they think that temptation is simply a nuisance. It's, it's something that kind of gets in the way of life. It's something that's kind of just an inconvenience. But one of the things that I want to tell you about temptation, the main thing I want you to hear from me in this opening is this. Temptation is an invitation 
to turn away from God. If you want to define temptation, you can talk about it being, you know, an enticement to do something wrong, you know, a decision to do something bad. But really, when you get down to the Bible, the Bible talks about temptation in light of how it relates to our relationship with God. And what you're going to see today is that temptation is a choice uh, to move away from the things of God and move to a different way of living. And so we need to understand that when we move away from following after God, we also begin to forfeit the life that God wants to offer us as we follow him. You know, in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus is speaking, and he says this to a group. He says that there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but that he, that it's Christ, he says, I've come to give you life and give it abundantly. You know, I believe that temptation is probably one of the greatest weapons that's used against us living the abundant life. And so when we talk about temptation, and we understand that temptation is to, an invitation to walk away from Christ, we need to understand that the reason it's also a big deal, because that's plenty, it's also a big deal because it's an invitation to walk away from abundant living. Now, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm not talking about working for your salvation. I am talking about that we can, even as believers, live in the misery and the muck of sin um, if we choose to walk away from following after Christ in our lives. And so um, as we look through James today, we're going to learn uh, a little bit about uh, where sin come, or where um, temptation comes from. We're also going to learn a little bit about how temptation works, and then we're going to talk about really uh, conquering temptation at the end of the service. Okay, so if you got your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to answer a question today that I think is crucial if we're going to battle temptation as well. And the first question is this, is where is the fight? You know, you can't fight something if you don't know where it's located. You, you can't fight an enemy if you don't know where the enemy really is located. And so James is going to tell us right now where temptation really starts. Look with me at verse 13. He says this, he says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. I want you to stop right there. James is saying this. Look, when you find yourself enticed to do something wrong, when you find yourself in a situation where you have a choice to either be obedient to the things of God and what he's taught in his word, or to take a detour and do life a different way, James is saying, I want you to understand, don't you dare. I mean, it's a command. It's emphatic. He's saying, don't you dare charge God that he is somehow to blame for your temptation. He says, God is so holy, he's not even tempted by evil. God doesn't have any predisposition in him that makes him crave something that he needs uh, that he doesn't have. God is holy. He's separate. And so James is saying, God uh, cannot be tempted by evil. And I think because of that, God wants to give us kind of a good deal too. So God says, you know what? I'm not going to tempt you with evil either. I can't be tempted with it. And guess what? I'm not going to tempt you. And so James says, if you're tempted, it doesn't start with God. He's not to blame. Well, most of us would say, well, I think temptation then, it must start with Satan, right? I mean, the devil, he's the one that came to steal, kill, and destroy. He must be the one that's responsible for all the temptation. And temptation must have to come from like hell and come up to earth and catch me here. And now I've got to make a decision on something out there. Well, James says that's actually not true either. Look back at verse 14. He says, he says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. James says the problem with temptation is this. It starts on the inside. Temptation is actually an inside job, you could say. In other words, temptation is not something that we have to deal with, you know, when the boogeyman comes in or when Satan comes in or because God's done something. He says temptation really starts because you and I and the people in this particular passage, we have our own evil desires, and that is the foothold that Satan needs to exploit us to cause havoc in our lives. 
You see, James is alluding to something that we know in theology uh, that, that comes all the way back from Genesis chapter 3. If you remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, a curse came on the world. And because of that curse, um, death and destruction and decay followed. And sin came on every generation afterwards. And because of that, now we are born in sin. David even says, in sin did my mother conceive me. What he was saying is, look, I'm sinful because I am born. I'm, I'm corrupt from birth. And that's not a popular thing. Nobody wants to hear that, you know. I think one of the most, tra the most uh, tragic things that modern psychology has probably propagated on the world is that we are basically good people and given the right opportunities, we'll basically do good things. Because I don't think uh, my experience bears that out very well. I believe that, that the Bible teaches that because of sin, we are corrupt. And because of our corruption, we have some natural things in our flesh that we crave that are not things of God. And so that's what James is alluding to. Now you might say, well, Chris, I'm a Christian. I mean, I'm not, I'm not still corrupt. Well, look, you have the Spirit of God now, but you still have to carry around the old flesh that you were born with. And as long as we are walking this earth, we're going to have a battle between walking in the Spirit or feeding the flesh. And so James says, you know why you're tempted? It's really not about Satan starting the fight. It's about you having an internal issue and a desire that's kind of corrupt. And because of that, Satan can now get a foothold and bait you away from God. He says that's where temptation comes from. It comes from inside ourselves. Now you can say, well, man, that's not very good news. Well, it's not good news, but it's great to know if you're going to battle temptation. Well, you say, well, how? How does that help me fight temptation? Well, I'll tell you how it helps you fight temptation. The biggest way is if you know where the battle is, then you can take the fight right where the enemy uh, lives. And so if I know that I already have a tendency to lean toward things I shouldn't lean to, then I know to be super cautious around those things. Look back at what James says. He says, you're, you're, you're drawn away, he said, by your own evil desire. Now, John MacArthur writes this really well, preaches this well, and, and he brings out the point, and I think he's probably right. He says, look, by saying his own evil desire, he's indicating another uh, thing that we see in the Scriptures, and that's this truth that a lot of us seem to struggle with very specific sins. Most of us, we'd call them pet sins. We have things in our lives that tend to kind of come up consistently throughout our lives. You know, when I started out, I said, you know, I, I have, my temptations have changed over the years different ways, but there are some things, one or two very specific things, that I think are those evil inclinations that are part of my flesh. They're part of my makeup. And I, I don't know if that sounds fair to you, but I do think it sounds real to you. Because I bet right now, if we were to poll everyone listening, and we were to say, hey, do you have one thing do you have one, one thing that you would have to say, you know, I keep revisiting that one sin. I keep struggling with that one thing. Some of you, it might be greed. You might say, you know, I, I'm not so bad in these other areas, but man, I love money. And no matter what I do, I just can't seem to get away from craving it. And I find myself working too much. I find myself, you know, doing kind of, uh, you know, un, 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 kind of unscrupulous business deals. I do everything I can because I really love money. Some people, it might be, it might be food. You're just like, look, I love food, but not like other people love food. I am addicted to it. And you have a problem there, and you, and you just really struggle there. Some, some people, it may be sexual sin. It may be that you're, you struggle with pornography or something like that. And, and, and it's just continually kind of in your life. Lust is always nagging kind of at your heels. Some people, it may be gossip. For some people, uh, you know, it, it could be materialism. It could be anger. It could be alcoholism. It could be, you know, drug addiction. It could be anything. But I want you to know that if you need need to fight that. You need to fight it where it really begins, and that is internally. And what that means is, if I know that I have a predisposition to kind of lean this way, then I need to put some distance between me and that particular thing. In other words, right now, guys, I don't have to put a lot of distance between me and cabbage. I don't like cabbage that much. I mean, it's okay, but I don't really struggle with an overconsumption of cabbage. So guess what? I can keep cabbage all throughout my house, and I'm never going to overconsume it. But there are things like zebra cakes and fudge rounds 
and Twinkies that I have to keep in moderation about my house because I know that I'm not prepared to fight the fight of saying no every time I'm close to them. Because you see, proximity will equal destruction if it's something that you tend to lean into in your sin. And that's what James is saying. He's saying, look, you need to understand, it comes from your own evil desire. And, and if you know that, then you can begin to put margin in your life between you and those areas. What that might look like if you're out there and you struggle with something. Maybe, you, maybe you're struggling with what you're watching on TV, or maybe you struggle with, with what you see on the internet. For some of, some of you like that, it might be that you need to put a filter on your internet. You might need to get rid of the internet altogether. I'm not, I know that's radical, but that's what we're talking about. We're talking about radically amputating the things in our lives that keep us from living the lives God's called us to. Because temptation is going to take root somewhere. This is about eliminating it ever taking root to begin with. You, you see, Satan's got to have something to exploit. He's like a virus. He can't live on his own. He has to have a willing host. And when we find ourselves headlong into sin, we can't blame him. It comes because we willingly let him have a foothold. And so if it's, if, it's, if it's food, then maybe that changes the way you shop. If it's alcoholism and there's a certain bar that you pass every day or a certain gas station where you get all your alcohol, maybe it's that you need to go a whole different way home. But I want you to start thinking, if I'm going to battle temptation, then I need to make sure that I set myself up for the most success. And that's going to mean distancing myself from access to the things that I struggle with the most. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, it really makes sense. And so James says it starts within. But, but here's what he also says. He says there's a, a process that starts once our evil desire is, is, is really recognized. And so he said, here's the process. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. The word dragged away is a hunting term, and the word enticed is a fishing term. The, word, uh, the, word dra the words dragged away is, is the, the idea of a hunter preparing to draw out the game from the woods. And you all, all know what this looks like. I mean, we're in Fairfield, Texas here, you know. Everybody just about hunts around here. And one of the things I've noticed is you put your deer feeders out, you, you, you bait, you're trying to get the deer to come out so that you have an easier, cleaner shot to get them. Uh, if you're fishing, that's what this enticed means. He's saying it's like you bait something. And what happens is, is Satan is a part of this process. And what he does is he takes that one thing that he knows about you that you're prone to, and he wraps up a special bait just for you. And he begins to fish. And he begins to hunt. And he begins to look for an opportunity to steal, kill, and destroy that's how it works. And so once you get to this point, you're not really in the avoidance anymore. You're being tempted now. Now it's a part of your day. It's not something you can, you can distance yourself from. It's a part of right now. And he says, so what happens is you're baited. You, you wanna, you, you're, you're being enticed. You're being drawn to it because it looks really good. And I, I want to just make sure you understand that. One of the things that I think churches have done a really poor job on is really being honest with people and not telling people that, you know what, the truth is, is that the bait looks really good. I think so many teenagers, they drift from church because they're told that all these things are bad and bad for you and, they, and they're not good and they don't feel good and they don't seem good. But then they go out and they experiment and they find out that we lied. The bait does look good. On the, it does. It, it, it feels good. It seems good in the moment. And, and so that's, that's how bait works. Bait wouldn't work if it was not good looking on the front end. And so he baits us and he says, but then something else happens. After the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So he says, look, there's another piece of this process. You have the sin nature. Uh, you have the, the, I'm sorry, the evil desire. And then you, you have on top of that a bait and now you have step three. There's this conception that happens. There's, it's a conceiving, and it happens between the bait and the actual sin. He says there's this process of conception. Now, he's, he's illustrating 
like it's childbirth. And that's kind of the picture he's trying to give, that, that between birth and between um, you know, not being pregnant, there is a process of conception. And what he's saying is, look, when it comes to temptation, there is a moment in time, and that moment may be a while, it may be just a few minutes, it may just be a few seconds, but there is a period of time where you see the bait, but you haven't acted on it yet. And you're kind of mulling it over. You're kind of thinking about it. You're kind of weighing it out. You're wanting the pros and the cons. Is it really worth it? And that's where that really crisis of conscience comes from. And he says, there's that period of time called conceiving. It makes me think of when I went to North Carolina last year. I went fishing in, at a trout farm. And if you ever want to feel like a pro angler, go to a trout farm. But we took the kids out there, and one of the things I noticed as we were fishing is the water was just really, really clear in those mountains. And as the kids would fish and they would throw their hooks out in the water, I would see all these trout kind of come close to the bait, but then they would just stop. And then they would stop, and they would just kind of stare at the bait for a little while. And some of them would finally swim away, but there was always one who took the bait. Now, I I began to think, what are they thinking? Now, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a fishologist. I think that's what a fish expert would be called. I'm not one of those, okay? So I'm not a fishologist, but one thing I think what's probably going on is I can just imagine kind of the dialogue, the kind of unspoken dialogue maybe between the husband fish and the, the wife fish. I'm just kind of imagining that. And I can imagine him go, Betty, look at that. That's a worm. And Betty's like, yeah, that is a worm, but I don't know about that worm. And, and he looks at it and he goes, but that worm looks good. And I think I might eat that worm, and, and he's thinking about it, and he's looking at it, and he's, he's contemplating whether or not that worm is safe. And the one that takes the bait has already believe, has believed that the bait is not deadly. And every fish that I ate as a result of that trip believed the lie that the bait was safe. And you see, that's what's going on with temptation. We go from watching the bait to convincing ourselves that the bait is okay. And that's what temptation does. It takes us through a progression of steps. And after we convince ourselves in our mind and our heart that it's okay, we act upon it. Or even if we don't say it's okay, we might say it's not going to be that bad. The consequences aren't going to be as extreme. It's not going to be that big a deal. And so we begin to kind of rationalize a way why we should have it. And so we take the bait and then that is the sin. He says, once the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. You see, to battle temptation, we need to make sure that we understand the cost. You know, I don't even know if I said that at the first one, but I want to make sure I clear that up because, you know, preaching to a camera, I forget what I've said sometimes. The first point was this, to battle temptations, we have to see ourselves correctly. In other words, we can't trust ourselves to always do the right thing, so we put margin in our lives. That makes sense? But, but the second part, he's saying this, to battle temptation, we need to understand the cost. You see, James is trying to spell out the cost to the people listening because he knows how easy it is to convince ourselves that the cost is really not that high. And he says, I want you to understand something about temptation. No matter how good the bait looks, no matter how much you want it, the cost leads to death. Not just physical death, that's what we're talking about. Metaphorically, it can mean misery. I I, I really liked, I don't like it, but I really think one definition of this death was so spot on. One writer said, this death is a misery of a life apart from God. And James is saying, that's what this is going to produce in your life. And I bet you there's people listening right now that you can track some of the worst situations in your life that you've ended up to at back to some simple decisions that you didn't say no to, some temptations that you didn't push away, and some of the biggest regrets and some of the biggest shame and some of our biggest failures are a result of just not saying no early in the process. And we're like that fish. We're looking at it. We're contemplating it. And we're not safe there, but we're better off than when we get on the hook because once we are on the hook, it is extremely difficult to get off. And so he says, look, you need to understand the cost. It is death. It's misery. It's a life apart from God. But then he says, you know what, to to battle temptation, you have to choose who to believe. You know, one of the things about battling temptation and winning 
is that it's really a, de- a decision on who you're going to believe has the best interest at heart for your life. You see, up to this point, James is writing about temptation and all that it's doing, and he says, you know what? Uh, the temptation is going to tell us so many lies. And, and I don't know if that's true for you, but it's been true for me that when I struggle the most with temptation, I begin to believe things that weren't true. I begin to believe that, you know what? I'm different than everybody else who's going down this road. It's not going to burn me. I, I begin to believe I'm not as far gone as this person, so it's not going to be as rough for me. I begin to think, you know what? I'm a little more spiritual. I can probably handle it. I even have bought into the idea that because I'm a preacher, I kind of deserve a little bit of that. I, I've, been, I've lived a clean life. I get a little of this now. And I've even bought into that lie. And James is saying, you need to make sure that you understand who has your best interest at heart. And so in verse, uh, where, where are we at? In verse 16 through 18, he says this. He says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. In other words, don't believe the lies you're hearing. Don't, don't believe that God's behind your demise. Don't believe that God wants you to run away some other direction. He says this, he says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Here's what James is saying. He's saying you need to understand Temptation is leading you down one path, and it's baiting you and promising you so much more than it's ever going to deliver. Temptation is going to promise you pleasure, but in the end, it's going to bring you pain. I want you to know something. God is offering to give you life because every good gift, every perfect gift, it comes from God. And so you can't get the good and perfect gifts from the world. You can't get good and perfect gifts from from the devil. You can't get good and perfect gifts from all these people. You can only get those from walking with God. And he says, I want you to know God is a giver of those kind of good gifts. We, We learned last week that he liberally gives those kind of gifts. God is a good gift giver. And he is wanting to give us an abundant life. But he says, don't be deceived. Don't believe the lie that this is not going to rob you of that lie, of that life. God is the giver of those gifts. And that life is possible through following him, not through submitting to temptations. And then he says, and and with this God, there's no there's no shadow of turning. God doesn't change. And, and what I think he's trying to get at is, you know, this, this book was probably written, uh, you know, 15 years or so after Christ was crucified. And I think even in that small amount of time, people probably began to kind of put words in the mouth of Jesus, uh, kind of like we do, you know. Well, I know he said that back then, but, but I think God means this now. And, and I, don't, I don't know that God is really that serious about this. I think God, you know, is pretty lenient over here. I mean, God is a God of love. And, and so we begin to think that God has changed his mind about, how we should govern our lives because God has had about 2,000 years since he spoke through his word. But here's what this passage teaches us. If God spoke it in the scriptures, it's true today. If God said that there's a way to live a godly marriage as a godly husband, guess what? That's still the way to be a godly husband in a marriage today. If God said there's a certain way to walk while you're you know, in courtship with purity, and that seems antiquated and outdated, that only seems outdated because God does not change, and those things are just as true today. If God said something about alcohol being in moderation and not excess 2,000 years ago, I bet you God means it today. You see, in every area where we wonder what God's purpose and plan and ways are, we don't have to wonder if it's different in 2020 because God does not change. It's not a popular thing to say that the God of the, uh, of the Bible is still the God of the day because we don't like to hear that those standards, those, the, those, those commands are still applicable 2,000 years later, but they are. And so we need to make sure we understand that. Do we believe God in that? Do we believe that that's the best way of life? And then he says, You know what, God has actually chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of a a kind of first fruits. You know, that word first fruits kind of means different things in scriptures, but, but primarily what I think he's trying to get at here is he's saying, look, the first fruits were the first offerings of a harvest, and they were devoted to God as this offering. And what would happen is when you had your crop, you would bring and devote your first fruits 
before the Lord, and they would be devoted and set apart for him. And he's saying, guess what God has done at salvation? He actually brought us as his people and said, you know what? You're going to be set apart. You're going to be unique. You're going to be special. Remember how the nation of Israel was special in the Old Testament? That's the people of God called believers in the New Testament. He says, you're going to be special. You're going to be set apart. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a plan for you. Don't forget that. But I'm telling you, temptation will short circuit that plan. So what you've got to do is decide, who do I believe when it comes down to what's best in my life. When I'm faced with trials, when I'm faced with temptation, when I'm faced with the decision to do this or do that, do I believe truly that God's word is best on the matter? Or do I believe something else? That's really the question I've got for you today. Because if you don't really buy into the fact that God's word is best, then there's really no point in talking about the rest of the scripture. Because God has not called us to a faith that only works on Sundays. He's called us to a faith that works all days. And so today, as we kind of wrap this up, I want to give you three, I guess, things I would love for you to take away from today's sermon. N- number one is this. If, if you take something away, I want you to take, take this idea away. We need to put margin in our lives because we are not trustworthy enough to always have the willpower we need. I know that's a, that's a mouthful. Let me say it another way. We need to put margin in our lives because we're not strong enough to defeat sin on our own. We need to put some margin out there. We need to prevent some temptation, not just deal with it when it gets here. Uh, n- number two, we need to make sure that we count the cost of the temptations that we're considering. It's so easy to, to think we're in a unique, special group that's not going to be phased like everybody else, but I'm telling you, The eventual destination of temptation is misery. It is. And I bet you we could have a testimony service right now and bring person after person after person that would tell everyone listening, I know what that's like. I've lived like that. I've lived apart from God. I've lived for myself. I live believing the world, and it led me down a miserable path. I've been there. I have. I've been there. I've walked my own path away from God, even as a believer, And it was the most miserable time of my life. So to make sure you understand that there's a cost, count that cost. But but finally, the last takeaway I really want you to take today is this. To battle temptation, you have to choose who you're going to believe has your best interest at heart. Is it God? Or is it some person who wants to entice you to do something? Or is it the, you know, Satan who wants to entice you to do something? Is it, you know, culture that wants to entice you to do something? Or does the God of the universe who sent his son to die for you have your best interest at heart? That's the takeaway I really want you to take and apply to your life today. I do wonder how many of us might be living lives completely foreign to what God is calling us to. And we don't even know what it's like to live an abundant life because we've never really lived an abundant life. And we don't even know what we're missing. You know, you know, when I see Jesus talk about, I've come to give you life and give it abundantly, I look at that and go, man, does that describe my life? Does that describe your life? Does it describe, what, is that how you would describe your life to people around you? Man, I live an abundant life because of Jesus Christ. You know, I think there's, the, the truth is there's a lot of us that, that we've lived so long a mediocre life. I don't mean to be mean, but I think there's a lot of mediocrity and we lived that life so long that we don't even know what we're missing. You know, one of my favorite kind of videos to watch on the internet, you know, I love to watch, you know, different kind of videos, but one of my favorite is when um, these little kids get their cochlear implants to hear, you know, for the first time or are these people that are colorblind get those glasses to help them see color for the first time. And what I love about that is you can always see an expression that, that's just in awe because they didn't know what they were missing until they finally saw it for the first time. I believe there's some of us listening that temptation has whipped our tails 
and God wants to give us a different life. But we're going to have to begin to battle temptation and believe that God's way is best. And when we get there, I imagine we will see like we've never seen before and we will never want to go back to mediocre again. An abundant life is what Jesus has offered. Is that the life you're living? Is that the life we as a church live? Or do we live normal lives? I'm going to tell you, I don't want a normal life because James tells me that I was chosen to be set apart. And there's nothing normal about that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for the blessing of coming into this place and to preach your word. God, I thank you for everyone that's listening. And Father, I do pray right now that you would turn the hearts and the minds of all of us to you. God, if there's anyone in here that's struggling, God, I know, never mind, God, I know there's people that are struggling, that are listening, that maybe, God, temptation has just ran them ragged. And God, I hope that today they begin to see a way to battle that they would see a way to take the fight to the enemy and stop being victims. And God, our prayer is that you would embolden us. You would give us strength. You would give us um, passion. You would give us courage and boldness to pursue you, God. To not be taken out by the darts and the arrows of the, of the Satan, but God, to walk in faith. Father, help us to truly believe that your way is the best way. Forgive us where we haven't. Forgive us where we have fallen. Restore us, God, where we have sinned. And help us to walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for listening today. I do want to invite you back next week as we continue our series here in the book of James. Um, I do hope that you were challenged. I hope that you were encouraged. And I hope that you were emboldened uh, to walk the walk of faith that God has called us to this week. Um, like I said, I can't wait to see you guys next week. Uh, we'll continue to keep you updated on our building progress here at Round Prairie. Uh, I do hope that uh, y'all have a great week. And um, if we can do anything, please send us an email, give us a call, send us a message on Facebook, and we'll do everything we can to get back with y'all as soon as possible. Y'all have a great week. Bye-bye.